catechesis. This is catechesis for conversion, the charismatic approach. So as I kind of said before, maybe you guys are coming in. This is a, uh, an exclusive. You can only get it here, not online. So it, it's primarily for CT track people, but it, it, it works for everybody. This is basically an overview, a big picture idea of what it is we do at Franciscan Catechetics. I'll get into that as we go along, but it, it's meant to give you um, a, uh, a big picture uh, uh, that you can, like placeholder, that you can take everything that you learn here and then understand how it fits in to an, a, a, a larger picture for catechizing, for conversion, which is now this big thing, charismatic catechesis, it's all in the directory, and for years and years, I guess I'll talk about that too. For years and years, it wasn't, and it was kind of like a bad word. You know, and, uh, when I was first a DRE in, in the early 2000s, I was like 2003, I was coming in 2005, um, when I would be in national places, you didn't say that you, you wanted to do charismatic catechesis. That was a dirty word. You know, everybody's doing shared Christian praxis and, and uh, Thomas Groom and, and charismatic catechesis. That's, that's, you know, that's bygone days, the 60s. We don't do that anymore. So, you know, I would come up with all kinds of creative words for it. <laughs> like like maybe, maybe I would say evangelizing catechesis or maybe I would say... Um, I don't know, I, maybe I'd say catechesis for conversion or something like that if I said things on a national level, if I said something I was speaking to people, I wouldn't say charismatic catechesis because then you'd be branded. Oh yeah, you're one of those. And, and then people started, well, Pope Francis started talking about it more. Pope Benedict talked about it. Pope Francis started talking about it a lot more. He used it, used the term almost in, in one of his, in I think Evangelion Gaudium. And then this new directory comes out, and they just say it, which is what I'm going to say. I'm kind of repeating myself, but they just say it. You need charismatic catechesis. I'm like, yes, finally. We know that. I've been trying to tell you people that for a long time. You don't listen. OK. So here we are. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's start. Here's the first question. Do you ever wish your lessons had more effect? <laughs> when I first came here, so we, uh, my wife and I, here's my wife right here. Everybody uh, give applause for my wife. She's great. <laughs> because she puts up with me. When I first came to Francisco, we had this big conversion uh, later in life and uh, reconversion back to our Catholic faith. And, and I really wanted to uh, teach people. And... So uh, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, to help convert people. And, and I, uh, we, this was like 1999. Um, Scott Hahn was first getting started, right? So I was like totally enamored with Scott Hahn stuff. He had just wrote his like first book, like Rome Sweet Home. Maybe he had, had, he, had a, he had this tape set of Salvation History, VHS tapes, mind you, and 14 set ta uh, tape set and and I was just like enthralled, right? So, that, so that's why I came to Francisca. I looked on the back of a, of a thing. It's like, oh, he teaches at Francisca. Maybe I can go there. And I just loved him, right? I took every class he ever had. But when I came here, I asked the people in admissions, I was like, okay, I want to learn how to convert people. Where do I go for that? And they said, oh, you need to talk to Barbara Morgan in the catechetics department. I was like, oh, really? Okay. I kind of like Scott Hahn stuff. I'm just going to do that. So I did that for a little bit. And then my wife and I, we taught CCD down at St. Peter's. I don't know if you guys have ever seen St. Peter's in the downtown area. We taught CCD, and I, and I had uh, fifth graders. Have you ever tried to teach covenant theory to fifth graders? <laughs> I mean, falling flat is not even close to the description of what that was, right? They just look at me like, are you crazy? Right? So, so I realized after that year where I got like nothing from them, like I need to learn a little bit more about how to do this instead of just, just saying a bunch of cool stuff. So 
So then I did go to see Barbara Morgan <laughs> and, uh, and, and said, hey, I need to learn how to do this, right? So I was, she's like, okay, okay. So, uh, so what, what I'm gonna tell you about today is what she taught me and a lot of other people here who were, who were uh, students, including Stella Jeffries right there, who was way before me, pioneer before me. So that's what this is. And I know, I know that uh, I, I, from the laughs and the little chuckles, I, that we probably all had that happen, right? Or is that just me? I don't know. Is that, is that just me? No, no. I know it's it, it's a it's a common thing, you know. We and and sometimes we can do everything right, and we still get those blank stares. But but there are some things we can do that would help us to actually you know get in there and and do it better. We could have a better chance of doing this. So, let's talk about the process of catechesis for conversion. What is that? So, you, maybe you've heard this before. You've heard it said that catechesis is a moment in the process of evangelization. Have you ever heard that? I never knew what that meant. What does that mean, a moment in the process? So, in the church's understanding, everything that we do to transmit the faith is the process of evangelization. So and here and here it is in the here it is stated in the directory. Catechesis is a this is what they say, a privileged stage in the process of evangelization and is generally directed towards persons who have already received the first proclamation. Okay, so this is the process of conversion in the directory. Now, it's gone through a couple of different iterations in prior additions to this directory, but basically this is it, right? You've got pre-evangelization, first proclamation, catechesis, ongoing formation, fully formed faith. So when they say it's a moment in the process, it means it's, it's, this is where catechesis belongs. The catechesis that you're used to doing, the catechesis proper that that where we were going to talk about every aspect of the Eucharist and, and talk about and break all of that out and help people to understand all of these nuances of the faith, right? But what happened, what has to, what's supposed to happen first? What's supposed to happen first is you have pre-evangelization. So pre-evangelization, they used to call that fundamental uh, catechesis. It's like answering the big questions. Who am I? Uh, why does everything exist? Is there a God? Why am I here? Those are the kind of questions that people who start to realize that there's more to life than everything around them, they, and they, they search for purpose and meaning, they start to ask these questions. And, uh, and those can be answered in very fundamental ways by you know not going into a lot of depth, right? It's like, talking about the existence of God. Why, why would there be a God? Why, why should there be a creation? Why, why are we not just random? All of those kind of things, helping people to understand. And you're, you're getting them curious about more. And when they're at the point where, and you're, you're telling them about Jesus too, but when they're at the point where they, they realize that they, they want something it, it, this Christian thing is, is really intriguing them. Now it's time for the first proclamation. What is that? That's the gospel message. First proclamation is, is, the, is the proclamation that the apostles have where they say, uh, I'm going to talk about this at length later, but it's, it's talking about the message of salvation in Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ died for you, and, it's, it, and he rose from the dead, and he's, he's here to bring you eternal life. That's the first proclamation or, or the gospel also called the kerygma. We'll get into that later. And then, once you've done that, and everybody is, is they understand, they, they, their curiosity is, is assuaged, they've heard this proclamation of Jesus Christ, they've made a decision to be Christian and to follow Jesus, however imperfectly at that point, they, but they've made the decision, their, their, their lives have changed now that they're, on, they're in love with Jesus and they're on fire, 
Now you teach them all the other stuff. That's where catechesis proper comes in. You teach them all those things that they're yearning to know because they want depth, right? They want understanding that, that will feed this faith that they have now. And once you've done that, maybe, you know, it, it could be an initiatory catechism. It could be a little bit more. You think about RCIA kind of like, you know, up to the point where they're ready to join the church. Then there's ongoing formation, formation that continues for a lifetime. And you can never really get to the end of it. And that can go on, again, for, for a long time until you have someone who is in fully formed faith. And that's somebody who is basically feeding themselves, like all of you, right? Nobody had to to tell you to go to Mass this morning because you really wanted to, right? You wanted to receive the Eucharist. Nobody's telling you to pray because you do, because you want to be closer to Jesus and you are an adult, a mature, uh, faithful Catholic, right? It's the process of evangelization. Catechesis is a moment in there. So back to the directory. The directory says that um, those who ask for or already received the grace of the sacraments often do not have an explicit experience of faith, though. Okay, so, so it says that these distinctions that we have in this process of evangelization, these distinctions, they're useful. However, in today's society, in, in, in today's world, we don't always get the luxury of having people go through all the stages. People, it says, people present themselves to you without having had the first proclamation, without having had this pre-evangelization. And, and there they are, right? And you have to deal with them. In your relig now, there's really no formal mechanism for that in our religious education to take care of this. We just kind of do catechesis, don't we? And even if you did, even if you had, you were DRE and you set up this perfect, now we can do this in RCIA because people come to us and we can say, okay, we're going to have this time period and we're going to go through a pre-catechumenate -catech and we're going to do some evangelization there and then we're going to do the rite of acceptance and we're going to have you accept Jesus and then we're going to do the catechumenate proper and we're going to talk about all the other stuff involved and then you're going to get initiated into the church. You can do that in the RCIA. In, in children's religious education, even if you did set up this perfect system and you had all of this throughout their primary grades in high school, what's going to happen? Somebody's going to come in. They're going to move in. And they're going to say, catechize my kid, right? Oh, no. I'm sorry. You can't be a part of our program because you haven't had pre-evangelization and first proclamation. Duh. Right? So, no, you can't say that, can you? You can't say you have to take them in. You've got to do something with them, right? So what do you do? That's what the church says. Those today who, who they've already received the grace of sacraments, but they don't have an explicit experience of faith. So it says, in the present context, it's no longer possible to stress such differences, these distinctions of the process. Those today who ask for or already receive the grace of the sacraments often do not have an explicit experience of the faith and do not intimately know its power and warmth. So they're coming to you, they're unevangelized. Then it goes on to say, this demand to which the church must respond at the present time brings into focus the need for a catechesis that in a consistent way can be called charismatic. I think I'm going over, over my thing. Okay, here we go. My, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not practiced with my slides here. I did this a year ago. So, here we, this, is, so this is the thing. We need a catechesis that can be called charismatic, meaning the catechesis that is entering more deeply into the charisma. The proclamation can therefore no longer be considered simply the first stage of faith, preliminary to catechesis, 
but rather the essential dimension of every moment of catechesis. What does that mean? That means what they're saying is you have to evangelize and catechize at the same time. Simultaneously evangelizing as you're catechizing. So as you are bringing out these aspects of the faith, you are doing it in a way that is evangelizing, that is charismatic, i.e., it's bringing forth the charisma as the central focus. Any questions? Like, oh, yeah, a lot of questions. I mean, how do you do it, right? Okay, so here we go. That's the rest of the talk. Okay, so the charismatic approach, how do we do that? So, so um, again, this is something that we've been doing here for quite a while, um, since the mid-'90s, this was a thing. Um, charismatic catechesis is, is something that came out of the 50s and 60s. It's a, an offshoot of the liturgical renewal. Catechetical renewal was happening at the same time. Um, these are the, the movements that led to the Second Vatican Council to, uh, to go back to the sources, to understand how, was the, how were things done in the apostolic age, and how was it that these fishermen were able to convert the entire known world? How did they do it? What were their methods? They would go back to the sources. They did it in liturgy. They did it in catechesis as well. And uh, a lot of that actually got lost for a while, but, but there was this uh, strain of people who really understood that this was the thing that needed to be passed on. And it was kind of handed on in secret a little bit. It was sort of clandestine uh, in Catholic University, uh, at the Catholic University of America, uh, a man named Eugene Cavan, Father Eugene Cavan, um, continued to do charismatic catechesis even through the 70s, Barbara Morgan, and um, you guys, and Gigi Zapian, who was my PCL person? Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. Gigi Zapian was another one who studied with Barbara Morgan, studied with Eugene Cavan, um, Bishop, uh, Bishop Laurie, too, actually, and, um, several, and some other people. Uh, they, they kept alive this charismatic catechesis. Barbara came here and started teaching it, and, and, it's, and the thing is, it's in all of the catechetical documents. Like when we, we do when we do uh, some of the, the classes, we go into catechetical documents and uh, see what the church writes about catechesis, and what they write about catechesis is what, we, what this is talking about. And John Paul II would say the same things. We could see it, but for a long time, people were saying, no, you can't do that, right? That's not the way to do it. But now they're saying it is, so it's really exciting. So we are guided here in charismatic catechesis by the work of an Austrian Jesuit named Johannes Hoffinger. Hoffinger wrote in the 60s before and after the council. He wrote before and then he amended his work after the council. And uh, again, this is from the Catechetical Renewal. So Hoffinger's work is called The Good News and Its Proclamation. It's kind of like a textbook in charismatic catechesis for us. And they, it's out of print. You can get copies used. But a lot of times, I don't know if they have it, but a lot of times they have it, it's run off, spiral bound in the bookstore. That's what we always have, spiral bound uh, copies of it. But you can get it there. You can find it in a uh, used, though. If you go to Amazon, you find, you can, you can get copies of it. So I would highly recommend, if you can get your hands on this, it's gold. It's fantastic. He is just so amazing. And this is what he says that drawing from St. Paul, Hoffinger says, if you look at the writings of St. Paul, you can see one fundamental theme that runs throughout his catechesis. One fundamental theme. He calls it the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ.
the, he says this. This is what he says. The message entrusted to us is made up of many different doctrines, but it is, by its very nature, far more than a list of truths. That's important. The faith is far more than a list of truths. It is a wonderful unity with one central idea that we must bring out as clearly as we can. The mystery of Christ, in Hoffinger's understanding, is basically the redemptive plan of salvation in Jesus Christ and, and how that manifests in the church and is brought to us and how we're restored by it. It's basically the gospel. Hoffinger doesn't call it that. He doesn't, he doesn't really call it the kerygma either, but, uh, well, he does, he does actually in some places. But this mystery of Christ is, is what we're talking about. This fundamental theme, it's throughout St. Paul, and he says that that is what we need to organize everything around. So the kerygma, the mystery of Christ, should be the central organizing principle of everything you do. All of your catechesis should be bringing out this idea of salvation in Christ and inviting your students into it. Everything we teach, every lesson, should be delivered from this understanding of the kerygma. Everything moving them towards transformation in Christ. What, is, what does Paul say over and over again? You are a new creation. You've, you've become something different. You've been transformed. So the idea is not information, but transformation. Your goal is not merely to impart information, but to bring them to understand that they can be a new creation in Christ. So catechesis with a charismatic approach seeks to guide people towards realizing that. So that's your, that's your objective. So now we've been talking about the kerygma. What is the kerygma? This is a good one. Pope Francis has this one. Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you. And now he's living at your side every day to, to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. That's a good one. A lot of people use that. Um, I, I don't think it's the best thing. Uh, I prefer the, 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 the four-point gospel, which is, like a lot of times people think is sort of like Protestant, but, but it's not really. It actually comes from Scripture. It comes from Romans. If you look at Romans 1 through 11, you can see this thing. Have you ever heard of the Roman road? The Roman road, it's not exactly, it doesn't exactly work um, in Catholic circles, but, but it, it, sort of, it sort of does, and it, it's basically what Paul is doing in Romans. He's leading you through this understanding of, of this four-point gospel, basically. But before I start, does anybody know it? Who knows it? I'm going to put you on the spot. Does anybody know what the four-point gospel is? Nobody does? Oh, everybody's shy. Here, here's somebody who's, he'll take a chance. Good. Excellent. Very good. Did you have something similar? What were you going to say? Same thing? Excellent. Yes. I'm so excited. A lot of times when I ask that, people say, oh, it's Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> I tell you, this was something for me when I, was, when I was growing up, I remember listening to televangelists and, on Sunday morning on TV and hearing them talk about the gospel, and I never knew. They never said what it was. Never said what it was. It's like everybody just knew. It, just, they, they, it was just understood. Everybody knew what it was. And I, I wondered, what is that? And then when I converted, reconverted, I was like, oh, I want to know what the gospel is. And I looked everywhere. I read all kinds of stuff. 
And nobody said what it was. Catholic, in Catholic terms. Nobody said what it was. And then I thought, well, I'm going to come to Franciscan. And when I come to Franciscan, they're going to tell me what the gospel is. And nobody did. It's like theology doesn't talk about this. Theology talks all around this. And they just kind of like, I don't know, assume that you know this. And uh, it, it's, and then, and then, like the documents, like the the catechesis, like the director for catechesis, they give you flowery, it's all nice and perfumey language, and and you're like, you still don't, they're so vague, you still don't know what you're talking about. Like, what is this we're talking about here? What is the? I want to know what is the gospel. It was like, it was okay. It was in it was in a Scott Hahn class. I was like, I was my first couple semesters, didn't hear it. I was, I started to think, I'm never going to know what the gospel is. And then uh, Dr. Hamas was lecturing, and he, he was talking about how his, um, his, one of his, his mentor professors from uh, when he was a Protestant uh, in, in school, he met with him after he had converted, and, and he had coffee with him. And uh, they sat down, and he said the first thing he said to him was, tell me the gospel. And so he rattled this thing off, and he's like, oh, Thank God, I thought I had lost you. That's what, his, that's what his mentor told me. I thought I had lost you when, you when you came to the Catholic Church. That's how much we don't know, right? And, um, and I, was like, I was like, oh, wait a minute. He just said the gospel. <laughs> I wrote it down really quick. Okay, what did he say again? <laughs> I wrote it down really quick. That was the first time I heard it. And then I learned more as it, when, when I went to go see Barbara Morgan. And I, I learned more. But um, the four-point gospel. This is important. This is like, okay, so... This is, I just said, it's like the fundamental theme. It's like the central organizing principle. This is everything, right? This is it. So um, you guys pretty much had it right. Creation. We were created for union with God. We were created in the image and likeness of God to be in union with him, to have relationship with him, to be intimate with him. That's how we were created. And he had, he had his, infused his own life in our, in our souls and that's how we're meant to live with sanctifying grace. Not having sanctifying grace is, is not natural to human persons. And, and so that's how we're, we're made. But the union was broken through original sin. Adam and Eve, our first parents, they, they disobeyed God in a major way. And, and they broke their relationship with God. And when they broke relationship with God, they lost that union with them, and they lost his life within them. They lost sanctifying grace. And so they're, they're just, they're lost, right? And that was our condition before Jesus came. Then God became a man, Jesus Christ. He died for our sins, and he made it possible for us to be in union with him again. He died on the cross, and he went to heaven, and he made the way for us to go to heaven too. But now, the fourth one is the kicker, and it's the one we never do. We hear this, you probably, you probably, you knew this already, we hear this in Mass all the time, right? Jesus died for our sins, he rose from the dead, right? That, and, and we're good, right? But there's one more aspect to this that most people miss, and usually when I ask people, they get the first three and they miss the last one. They miss, and it's important. It's so important, and that is this last one. You can call it restoration. You uh, can call it invitation. There's a lot of different words for this one. God is inviting you to be in relationship with him so that you can be restored to union and live the way you were designed and created to live. You are not meant to live without sanctifying grace. That's how you were created, and that's how you're whole. And the restoration is in Jesus Christ and in sanctifying, in receiving his grace and increasing that grace through the Eucharist and through reconciliation, you become more and more human. You become more and more whole. You become more and more godlike, but who you're meant to be. And you can't be who you're meant to be without that. But... We need to invite people. We need to invite people to this. And that's where the Protestants really get it. And, and I get so much pushback in Catholic circles 
from this last aspect of invitation. Oh, no, we don't invite people. That's what Protestants do. That's too forward. We don't do that as Catholics. We just let the Holy Spirit work in their lives, and eventually they're going to come around after like 20, 25 years. <laughs> I kid you not. I was, in, I was doing this thing at a, at a parish, and this guy, this deacon, he says, we don't do that. This was like just a couple of years ago. We don't do that. That's too much, too, too presumptive, too forward. You're going to run people off that way. And, uh, and I was like, I'm, talking, I'm just talking about inviting people to more. No, no, no. And so we were in this group, right? And there's this guy who he, uh, he converted. And so the deacon says, Joe, you, you converted to the faith, but you were in the parish for a while. He's married to a, a faithful Catholic woman in, um, in the parish. She works at the diocese. What made you join RCIA? He said, well, you know, he said, would you have left the church if somebody had asked you to join RCIA? He's like, well, no, I don't think I would have left because he was like going to mass with his wife for like 10 years. And, um, and, and going to mass and going to church events and doing stuff with the, with the parish. Like, no, I don't think I would have left because I really had a lot of friends and I really enjoyed the parish. Um, I probably would have left. He's like, well, what made you join RCIA? I said, well, one week uh, my wife saw RCIA in the bulletin and she put the thing down on the table and said, here, you need to go. I was like, that's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm seeing. <laughs> Somebody in a loving relationship who, know, who wants the best for you is saying, hey, why don't you check out RCIA or whatever and, and you know, Get this relationship with God because I think it's going to be good for you. <laughs> I was like, what are, we doing? what are we doing? Okay, so. Okay, now this, this is why this is important. Okay, this is why it's important. Have you guys ever heard of the hero's journey? Has anybody heard of the hero's journey? Yay, all right. Joseph Campbell fan. Anybody else? You have too. Oh, we, you, you guys are like ringers. Have you, been, <laughs> have you been to this talk before? Um, Hero's Journey. Joseph Campbell uh, is, is deceased now. Um, he was a uh, mythologist. He probably like, was the first mythologist and coined the term. He, he made his living off of this. He wrote this book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. It's his most famous work. And Joseph Campbell studied all of the world's mythologies and religions, and he found commonalities within all of them. And mostly hero stories, things like the Iliad and the Odyssey, but also uh, uh, Gilgamesh and, um, and other, and uh, there's African ones that are the same, uh, the, the journey of the Buddha, all of these things, right? He found these commonalities within them, and he codified them, the Hero with a Thousand Faces is this hero's journey. So every hero story, and, and we have these today, every hero story, classic hero story, follows this framework. And we have them in our own hero stories today. George Lucas was a very big fan of, jo of Joseph Campbell. So, for instance, you have... Luke Skywalker, a young farm boy on Tatooine who dreams of being a star pilot. But he can't because he's stuck on the farm with his uncle Owen and Aunt Beru. But then these droids come and he sees this message from a beautiful princess who needs rescuing. Oh, man. She's awesome. <laughs> I want to rescue her. And so he's like, yeah, but I can't because I can't go. And then he meets, so this is the call to adventure. Princess Lee is the call to adventure. Then the refuse, so then he meets, he refuses the call, and then um, he, I can't go. But he meets a mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi, old Ben, crazy old Ben, hermit out in the desert, right, who actually is a Jedi Knight. 
And he says, come with me to Alderaan to save the princess. Oh, no, there's no way. I can't do that. I'm just a farm boy on Tatooine. Uh, my Uncle Owen needs me for the next planting season. And, but then what happens? The Empire kills his uncle and aunt. And Obi-Wan says, hey, you got nothing left, right? He's like, yeah, let's go, man, let's go. So then they find, they find uh, Han Solo, and they take off in the Millennium Falcon. And what do they do? They cross the threshold. When they leave Tatooine, they cross the threshold into the special world, the mystical world, the world of transformation. They leave the ordinary, and they enter into the mystical. And then there's all kinds of things that happen. There's tests and trials. They have enemies. Um, they, they have, there's, an or, there's ordeals. Uh, there's a, usually a magic sword involved, like a lightsaber, right? And, and then um, they come back. They go through all of their trials. They have this big, huge battle. And, they, and then the hero comes back to the place where he left, but he's changed by his adventure. He's different. He's, he's more now than he was and often um, what he had aspired to be. And it solves some of the problems that he had. Bilbo Baggins is a quiet, respectable hobbit in the Shire, never doing any of those nasty things called adventures until, until a wizard shows up and says, hey, I want you to come on an adventure. Oh, no, no, no. Respectable hobbits don't have adventures. But then all these dwarves show up, and they, they get him all riled up, and he decides to go. And when he leaves the Shire, he crosses the threshold into the special world. And he has a magic sword that he gets. And they go through all kinds of trials and ordeals. And then what happens? They triumph, and Bilbo returns to the Shire, rich, but also different, wise, seasoned. He's now a man of the world. This story, you see it in a lot of different places. Even, uh, you guys ever hear of Tommy Boy? <laughs> Tommy Boy. <laughs> Tommy Boy follows the hero's journey. <laughs> we watched it. <laughs> we watched it. Tommy Boy has to save his father's company. He goes on this journey with this, with this, this guy who, who's a, a, a marketing dude with him, and he goes on this journey to, to save his father's company. He does it in the end. Anyway, <laughs> here's the point. Here's the point. <laughs> here's the point. In the hero's journey, the hero never wants to go on the adventure. There's the refusal of the call. Always there's the refusal of the call. The hero is comfortable. He's, in his, he's comfortable in his place. He's got everything he needs. And he doesn't want to go out because that's hard. He refuses the call every single time. The hero never wants to go until he meets the mentor. And the mentor is somebody who has already been the way. He's already been out in the mystical world. He knows the way, and he helps the hero to come on the journey. He helps the hero to move where he needs to be, to be who he's meant to be. The mentor is essential for the hero to fulfill his journey. Now, at some point after this, the mentor falls away, and the hero has to go on his own. Usually it's in the ordeal. The ordeal is where, the, as you see, it, the, the ordeal is exactly opposite of the, uh, the ordinary world where he starts. The ordeal is the place where he has to go through a serious trial and he's just about to give up. When he finds his inner strength without the mentor, and he, he has now the strength to go forward and to complete his journey on his own, and he has to do it on his own because 
He's the hero. If he doesn't do it on his own, he's not the hero. He's just a sidekick. The hero is the one who acts. The mentor must, must, call, must bring the hero into the ordinary, into the, the mystical world. All right, this is what you got to get through. You have to get this deeply implanted in your head. You are not the hero in this story. You are not the hero. You are the mentor. You are the guide. Your students are the hero. And they're going to refuse the call. They're going to refuse the call. They're comfortable where they are. I, I like my life. I've got everything all planned out. I'm comfortable in my sins. They're fun. I don't want to change. Change is hard. It requires effort. You need to break them out of their status quo. You, your job is to upset the apple cart. To, to, to make them uneasy. To show them that there's more in the mystical world. I've been there. I've been the way. Right? I know what's in the mystical world, and you don't. And I want to show you what that is. I want to show you the riches in Christ. I want to show you what life with God can be and how it can be more than what you are now and how it can, you can be what you're meant to be. That's the gospel. And you have to be the guide and you have to get them out of the ordinary world. That's why invitation, that fourth one, is so important. So important. We cannot leave it out. All right. Good? Okay. Now, second aspect to Hoffinger's charismatic catechesis is what he calls... The means of insertion into the mystery. Okay, question. Uh, if I may. Um, so is refusal of the call in order to be a hero always necessary? It, it just, it always appears in the hero's journey, and it's human nature that, that most of us need some kind of nudge, right? Now, it can happen outside of a personal relationship. It can happen that the Holy Spirit does just nudge somebody to the point where they're, they're restless enough to search. Most often, though, people that take on a journey of conversion are doing it because they have met someone or been in some situation where they're exposed to something else. Even something simple as um, somebody one time went to a boss's funeral, Catholic funeral, and experienced a presence in the church that they had never experienced before in their other Christian churches. And they said, this is, there's something here that's different, and I need to know what that is. But some event, something, something usually needs to, to, to rouse the hero out of his, his comfort zone. And, and, uh, and most often you find that, that, um, that people that you're trying to mentor in this way, they're going to need some kind of invitation. So, some kind of challenge. Does that make sense? So, I mean, it's just human nature. You know, we're, we're all just, we're all comfortable in, our, in, in the things that we do. To go out and to, uh, to try something new is very difficult. Especially if we don't have somebody that, that we know that's, that's going with us, and, and it, it can be very uncomfortable. So the means of insertion in the mystery of Christ. There are certain ways of catechizing, certain things that you can do that are more conducive to entering into the mystery of Christ than others. And these Hoffinger calls the means of insertion. So the first means of insertion is biblical catechesis. Hoffinger calls that the, the foundational way. 
foundational because story is the best way to teach anything. We all learn best as story uh, with story. We're storytelling animals. It's just what we are. I challenge you to get through at least a couple of days, maybe one week, without a story. What do you do every night, right? You go and you watch TV, you watch a, a series on Netflix or whatever. You're, you're engaging in a story. We need them. They're great for us. They teach us how to live. That's how society was passed on you know, in, in the ancient days by telling story. We're storytelling animals. The best way for us to learn is through story. And Catholicism is really nothing else but the story of God's dealing with mankind and, and how he's bringing us back into his family through Jesus Christ and the church. That's what it is. So storytelling is foundational. So catechesis, according to Hoffinger, Catechesis for children really should begin with biblical catechesis. That's why it's the foundational way. Um, teaching, but teaching, not, not catechesis like, uh, not the biblical catechesis where we're talking about, you know, um, when were the Gospels dated and, you know, historical criticism and those kinds of things. We don't, you know, I've seen high school textbooks, junior high textbooks, that went into historical criticism. They're talking about um, why uh, why the the gospels were written and who wrote them, and and maybe maybe the apostle uh, didn't write them, and they were you know written by people who in the school of Paul and all that. Like whatever, you know, they don't need that. That's not what they need. What they need they need to understand who Jesus is. That's what kids need. The kids need to understand who Jesus is. That He's there for us. He's our friend. He's our companion, our guide. He's our savior. Those things to, should be the first order. They should understand, and, and by reading the Gospels, you're getting to know who Jesus is firsthand, right? And in, this, in the, the, the next workshop that I do, I'll talk a little bit more about how you do that. But, but that's, that's critical. So biblical catechesis, the foundational way. The next way is liturgical catechesis. He calls that the prime way, the prime way. So liturgy is catechetical. Liturgy is catechetical. And it's special because the liturgy not only teaches, but it gives what it teaches in the form of grace. Liturgy is the place of transformation. That's where we receive the the grace of Jesus, that's, that's where we're transformed. So learning how to fully participate in the liturgy, understanding liturgy and what it is, is vital for being inserted into the mystery of Christ. And also, not just liturgy as in mass and, and sacraments, which is a primary, but also the liturgical year and what that teaches. So the solemnities and feast days, what, you know, we have those in the, in the liturgical year because they're important. We need to emphasize them. They're, they're essential aspects of our faith. So what are they teaching us there through the liturgy? Uh, the saints' feast days, too. The saints, you know, marvels there. They're, I, I think they're lived theology. The saints are lived theology. They are... They are the grace of Christ manifest in human experience. And so we, we, we study the saints. We study liturgical feast days. We, we celebrate them as much as possible. So that brings the Bible of 2,000 years ago, right, into present. We don't teach the Christ of history we teach Christ here and now. Christ in you, Paul says. Christ in you is the hope of glory. That's what we teach. And so Jesus is alive, right? We don't, we don't think about that. You know, it's like there was this, that big, you know, Paul has this big argument with the, the Pharisees, you know, when he's, he's with Agrippa uh, and, and Felix, he's, they, they put him on trial. Like, why are these guys angry at Paul? Well, they say this guy was dead, and Paul says he's alive. You know? He's alive. 
And we can get to know him, but he's here and now present in the liturgy. And the liturgy, well, first of all, connects what happens when you do liturgical feasts in your classroom. You're connecting what happens in church with what's happening, with, your, with what you're learning. And then and there's, there's grace involved, but it's also it's bringing all of that into the present so that religion isn't just what's out there, but it's one, what's in here. It's what's happening now in my life. It's, that's really important in the family. If you can do that in the family, that's like so critical. <clears throat> so liturgy is the second means. The third means is systematic catechesis. Systematic catechesis. What does that mean? It means having a plan. We don't just teach willy-nilly. We don't just teach whatever. We have to teach in some order because some truths are more foundational than others. Not that they're more important, but they build on each other. You can't learn about the Eucharist until you know Jesus is God. And systematic also means calculated for an effect. So, so you are trying to bring out in all of this, in these means of insertion, what are you trying to do? Bring out the mystery of Christ. You're trying to help them to understand, and you're inviting them into the mystery in small ways, trying to do that all the time. And so it can relate to your lesson, how you do that, and it doesn't have to be huge, but it's just little challenges, little invitations to maybe read a passage of Scripture on their own or to pray a certain way or, or to do something with their family or discuss something. Or maybe it's in class. You're, you're having them do some kind of activity that's inviting them to go more deeply into the mystery. All of these means of insertion, you're bringing out the mystery of Christ and helping them to understand it more and more. So, so as you're doing your lessons, you can, you can draw out things with this in your lessons. For instance, like instead of the, you have a Bible passage in your textbook, and it introduces the lesson, and then you have a bunch of text in the lesson. Okay, instead of doing that, go to the Bible passage, read it all the way through, teach from the Scripture. And, and draw out the lessons that are, uh, are they, you know, in, in the textbook they say, okay, have the students read this, then have the students read this. Okay, instead of doing that, use the scripture, ask questions, draw out the things that the lesson says are important that they need to know in that, in that lesson. Have them, have them figure that out on their own and then, but you're doing it, so you're doing it through the scripture, right? You're, and you're using your Bible you're reading from the Bible, not just from the textbook. And they see that this Bible thing is something, it's something special, right? It's something different. And you know, you don't just put your coffee on the Bible, and you put your Bible on the table and put your coffee on the Bible. You know? It's reverenced, right? It's important, special. So they see that. You do liturgical things within your classroom. They call it, we call it having a liturgical envelope within your class. Not only do you start with prayer, but you might start with the scripture of the day. Or you might have a Bible uh, table, a little prayer space set up with the crucifix and the Bible, and you take your Bible off of that and you read the scripture of the day. And you have them go through the same motions that they do in Mass. So, you know, after you finish, you say the word of the Lord. They say, thanks be to God. You, do, you, write, you read a gospel. They do the sign of the cross over there forehead and lips, and, and you have it, you make, the, you bring liturgical things in, you bring holy water in, you have them sign themselves as they come into the classroom, because this is a holy space, right? We do, you bring in liturgy, and you work in liturgy, you take colics from the mass, you take um, uh, little aspects of, of things from uh, liturgical feast days, things in the Mass, and you, and you work that into your lessons, right? You use, those, use those, that language so that they hear it again. Then the last thing is this. The last thing is 
there's, he doesn't really, Hoffman doesn't really have a word for it, but I just call it the, the communal personal aspect. The, I, the thing is that, that you as the catechist will never authentically be replaced. There is no substitute for you being in front of a bunch of kids or a bunch of students and being a witness to the faith to them. A book or online learning can never replace the person who's standing in front of you and is pouring themselves out to those students and being a witness. Barbara uh, used to say that a catechist never merely imparts information. The catechist imparts themselves with the truth at hearing. The catechist imparts themselves with the truth at hearing. The personal aspect is vital to be able to pass on the faith authentically. And the influence of the community and the family as well. The parish is the locus of catechetical formation. And uh, the pastor is the head of that. And he's doing that for the bishop. And so, so the communal aspect of the faith uh, can't be done without. It's essential to insertion into the mystery. Uh, Cardinal, Cardinal uh, Newman, you guys know uh, Carl John Henry Newman? He's really big on this. His, his idea is personal influence is huge in, in the work of Newman. Newman wrote a sermon really early in his career, when he was still an Anglican, uh, he posed the question, how did the faith the, survive through all of the turbulence of the early centuries? Persecutions, um, negative uh, effect of society, all of those things. What was it that, that did that? And he, he came up with a bunch of ideas and then you know, systematically just kind of shot them all down. And he said that the reason why the faith was, was transmitted the way it was was because the people who were the transmitters of the message were themselves examples of it. The people who were saying what they were saying were living it themselves. They were a witness of the message that they were transmitting. And that is the reason why Catholicism spread so heavily, so, so uh, thoroughly throughout the empire. And, and that's why this is so important. And, and, and your witness is so important. 